moderator like a moderator we have a good crew started already we have a good team going on here and we'll get a few more of course we'll probably join us as time goes by welcome jeff i'm very excited to get to you but before we get rolling as usual welcome to the dank hour here on future cannabis project down on clubhouse where we bring a dank conversations and 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 kind of just just get down with experts and, and enjoy a regular night of conversation talk about what we're passionate and what we're digging into and what we're talking about and i like to give each and every one of you a seat at the table um we like to bring in doctors experts from all over the space all of all over the world and today is no different um that happens i've been i've, I've been fangirling all week because i've been excited for this episode um, with Jeff Lowensfeld, the Lord of the Roots, um, and talking about everything that's going on in his world. But as we like to start these episodes every single week, we like to do a little bit of a mic check. We like to say hi to our uh, panel of experts. And as as you can see, Jeff, there is a list of pictures with names at the very top. Those are the people that are on the panel speaking right now. And um, down below, you have this. The, you have the um, people that are listening and in the listening room. Um, so what we like to do is we'd like to go through the panel. So we're going to go Johnny, Wendy, yourself, Tess, and Che. Um, and then any of the other experts that might automatically come in and join us as time goes by. Um, and we're going to just say a quick hello, hi, who you are, and, and maybe tell me how the weather is there and uh, do a little mic check so we make sure that we can hear you nice and clear. Um, that way we get quick introductions for everybody, but we also get to check out those microphones and, and get your questions and stuff ready because we're going we're gonna to open up at a later um, third of the show, later bit of the show to do questions. So if you have questions, don't be afraid to type them into chat, put them into either of the chats. We'll save them and dock them for the end. I'm not going to promise we'll get to all of them, but we'll try and answer as many as we can out of respect for time for all of our experts and speakers that are here today. And today is no different as we are here on the Dank Hour and I am London, your master of moderation, uh, director of dialogue and all around weird guy that likes to talk about cannabis and and even better is i get to share and talk about my passion with each and every one of you and get into that so that's who i am johnny why don't you take us off introduce yourself hello everybody i'm johnny i am a cannabis cultivator by trade and all around uh, cannabis enthusiast um and really focusing on organic and regenerative and sustainable practices uh, um, it's really an honor to be up on stage with, with Jeff. He is kind of one of the quintessential figures that really helped me get going down this path. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. Um, so yeah, Wendy, I believe you are next. Hello. Hello, everybody. It took me a minute to figure out how to turn my mic off. It's been a while since I was on Clubhouse. Um, my name is Wendy Kornberg, and I run Sunabus Humboldt's Full Sun Farms. We're a small second-generation cultivation um, outdoor regenerative farm in southern Humboldt County. Um, I've also been doing a bunch of advising lately, and I won't say consulting because of legal issues. Um, apparently, you, you consultants in California really have to have a lot of um, a lot of uh, legalese stuff. So heading down that path eventually, but not until we get done with harvest this year. Um, and yeah, this is amazing. I saw this posted on Facebook earlier and I was like, oh, that's when I have to get on to and listen to at least. So thank you so much for inviting me up. I'm extremely honored and privileged. And um, yay, Jeff, I'm so excited. I got to hear him speak at the very first Regen Conference in Portland, Oregon, and I laughed and I was inspired and I already had his books, but uh, I was actually inspired to start reading them. And then I got it on audiobooks, which I was like, oh yay, now I can actually listen. <laughs> but <laughs> I do recommend reading because you don't get the visuals. So thanks for having me, everybody. Oops, was I supposed to invite the next person? Uh, Jeff, you're up next. <laughs> yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm going to be doing enough talking. Uh, I'll just pass it on to Tess. Awesome. Very cool. Well, my name is Tess Edom. Hi, everybody. I run a consulting company called Rogue Micro, um, and we help cannabis cultivators and manufacturers um, overcome microbial challenges and produce, you know, high quality, safe products um, by managing their microbes. So I'm a microbiologist by training, 
uh, worked in cannabis for a few years and now I've hopped over to helping folks with their micro problems. So kind of a micro wrangler, kind of a microbe assassin, sort of bridge the gap there between those two worlds. And now I'm, I will hand the baton to Che. Thanks, Tess. Uh, yeah, my name is Che LeBlanc. I'm the founder of Rosebud Cannabis Farms. We also do something out here called uh, the Unicorn Cup. And one of the founders of Antidote Processing here in uh, the Kootenays, BC. Teaming with microbes has been, uh, or some people in my circle would refer to as the Bible, has been very instrumental in a lot of our production methods and uh, has a big impact on the quality product we're, we're able to produce. And so I'm really excited to uh, to be here in the room, uh, present with one of my teachers. So thanks for joining us today, Jeff, and thank you everyone else for joining too. Well, Jeff, I've been trying to figure out how to like have this conversation like what do we what do we want to talk about do we want to get into the science of it do you want to lean in the back parts and, and one of the cool things and i'll tell you about like a little bit of the rules of the, how we do the day calories it's 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 important to segue right uh getting into those finer details getting into those points of conversations that kind of draw us to conclusions that we need to be at those are those are the conversations we like to highlight here so if there's a segue or avenue we're just going to follow it right down the path we're going to try and structure this. i was like are we am i going to drill him about his foot i'm going to do this am i going to do that? and my thought is like let's just hang out and get to know jeff as you are yeah you know sure. and, and and so why don't you tell us a little bit about how how the hell you ended up in this wacky world that you are in now well, you know, that's an interesting story to me, but I don't know if it is to anybody else. Uh, I, I'm an attorney by trade because I'm not smart enough to be anything else. <clears throat> and uh, I was working on a gigantic project up in Alaska, and uh, we had some political problems. And lo and behold, the company I was working for decided it was going to shut the project down. And while we were in the process of doing that, a guy, a truck driver, came into my office with a sample of soil. And he said, this is the richest soil on earth. It's all over Alaska. Uh, I've had Dr. Elaine Ingham test it. And she says it's got 35,000 different kinds of fungi and, you know, umpteen million different kinds of bacteria. And I want to transport this stuff out. I want you to go into business with me. <laughs> Well, I didn't know what he was talking about. <clears throat> I was really uh, uh, interested in soil, but not not to the extent of selling it. Uh, and lo and behold, make long story short, yeah, this was incredible soil. It did unbelievable things. And it turns out to be the soil that grows the big cabbages in the Matanuska Valley that everybody sees uh, once a year in the, in the newspaper uh, when they have the big contest at the state fair. It's not the sunlight. Everybody always thought it was. The place where they grow these cabbages is 20 minutes away from Anchorage. Uh, and we can't grow them because the soil that grows these big cabbages has been removed. It's got geotechnical problems when it's 30, 40, 50 feet thick and you can't build on it. So they take it out and they put it in a landfill, not in the Matanuska Valley where these big cabbages grow. <clears throat> and to confirm all of this, we now have a guy in Anchorage who has grown uh, uh, pumpkins to 2,000 some odd pounds using the soil. So uh, it's really unbelievable stuff. It convinced me that the microbes in the soil were the ticket to uh, how we should be growing stuff. Um, I learned an awful lot from Dr. Elaine Ingham and uh, was lucky enough to be able to take a lot of the stuff that, that she teaches uh, and that she came upon and reduce it into a, you know, a, a language where someone like myself can understand it. Uh, and so teaming with microbes came out and, and that was sort of the beginning. Um, you know, and that, and that might be the right place to start the conversation because <clears throat> I think we all have the view of the soil food web uh, that that really is in teaming with microbes. It's, it's Dr. Elaine Ingham's uh, research that we that we codified there, and and you know so it's a, a pretty simple process, although it's very complicated. But it's a, simply put, the exudates that a plant produces 
attracts bacteria and fungi. They get eaten by protozoa and nematodes. The excess is pooped out, and that's plant usable nutrients. The reason why it's plant usable nutrients is because the microbes put a charge on it and they're able to get into the plant as a result of that charge. And, and that's described in Teeming with Nutrients, different, different book, but, but some of those bacteria, it turns out, and now I'm getting into uh, the last book that I, that I just came out two weeks ago, some of those bacteria don't get eaten by the nematodes and the protozoa. Some of them decide based upon something that they smell to move into a new area. And they're, they're, they're sitting right there next to the rhizosphere and they smell this butyric acid buttered popcorn smell. And it causes them to move out of their existing slime colony and and go to what they think is a new slime colony. It turns out they're being tricked by the plant to move through the meristem root cells at the very tip of the plant. And lo and behold, the bacteria finds themselves inside the plant. And they go, what are we doing in here? Uh, but before they can do anything, the plant sprays them with an oxidant, uh, something called ROS, uh, reactive oxygen series. And this ROS is sprayed on the bacteria ostensibly to kill it. But instead of just killing the bacteria, it just strips the cell wall off of the bacteria. And that cell wall contains some of the minor nutrients, some of the major nutrients that the plant needs, and they're absorbed by the plant. Now, the, the bacteria doesn't like this. And so the bacteria does two things. It sprays the plant back with ethylene. And ethylene does two things. It causes the cells to grow, the plant root meristem cells to stretch. And uh, it causes the, 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 the plant to give a little bit of carbon to the bacteria, uh, which they use to make nitrite which weakens the ROS, it acts as an antioxidant so that the bacteria don't get further degraded. And the end product is the production of nitrite, which gets converted to nitrates. And this too is absorbed by the plant. The plant is absorbing this nitrogen, which was fixed by the bacteria inside the plant cell. Now, all of these bacteria are in this little space that, that's around the cell wall of the plant, meristem cell. <clears throat> and the example I use is a tofu container. The white is the plant meristem cell, very thin walled. The bacteria go through there and find themselves in that water that's always in a tofu container. That's the periplasmic space. And then you get to the tofu, that's the internal cytoplasm part of the cell. So the bacteria are now uh, being sprayed. They're spraying back. They're producing nitrogen. And they multiply every 20 minutes anyhow. And so they multiply. It's probably a little bit easier because they don't have a cell wall. And their numbers increase. And they're circulated around this periplasmic space, that water in the tofu container. So they're circulating around. And the ethylene that they're producing is getting spread around the entire plant. And the next thing you know, there are so many bacteria that they begin to back up against the plant cell wall. And the ethylene doesn't get circulated. Instead, it concentrates. And when ethylene concentrates against the cell wall, it causes a tube to form. You and I know this tube to be a root hair. The root hair is caused by these bacteria producing ethylene. And the ethylene causes the root hair to grow. It's just a tube coming out of the cell. So it's part of the main meristem cell. It's, it, it grows and the bacteria are continuing to multiply. They back up into it. And at some point, there's so many of them that they are blown out of the tip of the root hair. And that can happen for a root hair four or five times. The bacteria get get crowded in the root hair and are blown out one, two, three, four times. 
they go back into the soil, they regrow their cell wall, and two or three days later, after having been on this trip for two or three days, they go back into the plant and repeat the rhizophagy cycle and feed the plant nitrogen that it fixes inside the plant. So you've got the 2006 version of the soil food web, which is basically where the, <clears throat> the microbes are mediated in the soil and move into the plant. Then you've got the addition of mycorrhizal fungi in 2008 or 9. They became so plentiful that people began to recognize they were very important. And now we've got the bacteria that aren't eaten and pooped out, but instead go through this rhizophagy cycle. They're called endophytic bacteria, and they feed the plant up to 40% of the nitrogen. Which plants do this? Any plant with a root hair. If you take these bacteria out, you don't get root hairs. And then if you put the bacteria back again, root hairs grow. Whoa, who knew? Unbelievable. Now they're still taking in nutrients, but they're doing it after the rhizophagy cycle. They're very thin walled, these root hairs. And so they're able to, 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 to take in this soil mediated type uh, nutrient and, and, and some of the mycorrhizal fungi uh, are able to invade them. So, so that's rhizophagy. Uh, it's not something well known. Uh, it's something that adds to the soil food web, doesn't detract from what Dr. Elaine discovered. And the person behind it right now is a gentleman at Rutgers University named Dr. James White. And he's continuing to do research, some of which has some unbelievably startling implications to the growth of cannabis. So there's a thread. <laughs> Oh, we got we got a few lines to pull there. Holy, so so first of all, I want to make sure I get the name right of, of the doctor, Doctor uh, Doctor James it? White, James White at Rutgers University. Doctor James White, he's a he's a, actually a mycologist, uh, and and so some of these rhizophagy bacteria are joined by rhizophagy fungi, basically yeast, uh, but 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 it's really the bacteria doing it. Okay, so I mean, shit, <laughs> Jeff, why you gotta drop the bombs right away? Like, <laughs> no, I'm just well, because I wanted to do it before we all got too stoned. You know what I mean? Uh, that's that's a for sure thing, which is awesome. And we'll get into like kind of because I, I really I want to get into the cult, like some of your cultural points because you, you you do have this ingrained loving kind of affair with the cannabis plant that you that you do in your works. Like yeah. you do the the, the the we'll get into that, but I really want to give Tess an opportunity to jump in. Because Tess sure. is our in-house microbiologist. She's got her PhD <laughs> in microbiology, and I'm sure you just tickled her fancy with all sorts of nerd talk. I was so tickled. It. I've been just smiling the entire time you've been talking, Jeff. So, like, I first of all, I love that you're talking about bacteria. I'm I'm really a bacteriologist uh, by training, and I know Ooh. fungi are great. I love them. Don't get me wrong, but I love my bacteria. You know, they've been right. around a couple billion years more. They got some street cred here on planet Earth. So I really like uh, your story um, and, and how you phrase everything, too. And I also like that you use food to describe anatomic features of microorganisms because <laughs> I do the same thing with like gram positive and gram negative bacteria as a sandwich <laughs> with two uh, yeah with the with two loaves of bread on the outside um so love all those things so like you know a lot of times when we talk about microbes in this industry um you know some folks are thinking a lot more um, along the lines of how do I build these soil ecosystems and, uh, you know, grow a healthy plant and things like that. But a lot of times they're just like fighting off bad microbes that could, right. um, you know, contribute to all sorts of problems. So how do you think um, maybe shifting focus back to regaining that balance because you know it's, microbes have really strong relationships with pretty much every living creature on the planet we've never lived here without microbes being present um you know even within our own guts we have microorganisms 
sending us little signals all the time, you know, serotonin and all these other good things. So like, how do you think uh, cultivators could be a little bit more proactive by bringing their microbial ecosystems into balance in their gardens? And just a heads up, Jeff, I can't undo it, but I did mute your microphone. There was some feedback happening while Tess was talking, so I just muted you while you weren't speaking. So you'll have to unmute to talk again. My yeah, apologies, I go. hate doing it, but it, it just creates a little bit cleaner of an audio. Thank you so much. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I was moving around, doing some paper stuff. Um, yeah, it's a great question. The 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 concept of um, uh, the bacteria inside the plant. So the name of this book that I just published, uh, actually, literally two weeks ago, uh, Teeming with Bacteria, um, uh, The Organic Gardener's Guide to the uh, Endophytic Bacteria and the Rhizophagy Cycle. So endophytic bacteria are these bacteria that live inside plants part of their life. So these rhizophagy uh, bacteria are endophytic bacteria. But there are other endophytic bacteria that get into the plant uh, mainly through cracks in the root system. So when a root begins to branch, there's a crack there and bacteria are able to get in there. Some of them can get into stomata. We know they can also obviously get into infections. These bacteria uh, contain, well, so the, the question that one would, would ask, and, and plants are full of these endophytic bacteria. These endophytic bacteria, what are they doing in the plant? It's really a twofold question. Why does the plant let them live inside the plant instead of taking them out? Because plants have the capability of, of doing that in various ways. And why would a bacteria want to be inside the plant in the first instance? Well, these bacteria uh, go into the plant basically because there's no competition. In the soil, oh my God, they got all manner of competition. They got to look over their shoulders left and right. Uh, when you're inside the plant, it's a different story. You've got a food source. There's ample sugars. Um, there's there's moisture. There you know, and there aren't as many bad guys trying to take you out all the time. Why would the plant let it in? Well, it turns out these bacteria produce phytohormones. Uh, auxins, gibberellic acid, uh, ethylene, and these are all things that help the plant grow better, uh, develop the flowers, drop the leaves, drop the flower, form seeds. All of these things come from phytohormones, which these bacteria contain. And they produce other metabolites that take out the bad guys. And so if you've got the right mix, you end up with uh, some pretty fine cannabis without having to use anything other than uh, uh, organic material. It's just a it's just a, a beautiful, clean, great system. So the, the the thing that you need to achieve is the balance. When you're out of balance, you know that's when the bad guys take advantage of something. Uh, the biggest thing that puts plants out of balance is is the chemical fertilizer that people use. You use microbial foods. Uh, you you attract and, and feed the microbes, the microbes feed the plants, the microbes in the soil produce uh, just like the microbes inside the plant, metabolites that take out bad guys, uh, citophores uh, that, that lock up uh, nutri uh, you know metals so that they don't poison the plant or, or take in a particular uh, or, or associate with a fungi. Some of these bacteria, uh, you know, what are they, plant beneficial promoting, plant growth promoting bacteria. They associate with fungi and help the fungi uh, fix uh, uh, phosphorus. You know, so the, so the the trick is to let nature take over, uh, and it's a very hard thing for gardeners to do. Yeah, that's not even like microbe wrangling. It's almost like microbe god, like creating these ecosystems. You're like microbe ecosystem creator i don't know it's like next level of, of wrangling well, the microbes yeah and it's and the interesting thing about it uh is that we're capable of producing now think about the futures where it's going to be a hundred thousand times easier uh, uh, uh different kinds of microbes so for example 
the microbial mix in vermicompost versus the microbial mix in thermal compost is different, different kinds of microbes. And, and so some plants do, these bacteria are not quite the same as, as the mycorrhizal fungi. We only know about 12 or 13, we're only able to produce 12 or 13 or 14 of the mycorrhizal fungi. I think the 350 different kinds, but we can only produce a very small amount of them, but they sleep around. So one mycorrhizal fungi, you know, can affect many different kinds of plants, not necessarily so with bacteria. Um, and, and so you got to get the right mix uh, with the right plant. And, and I haven't done the experimentation yet, but if I was growing cannabis professionally, uh, I would certainly see which one of those thermal versus uh, uh, um, vermi uh, does uh, does a better job growing my cannabis plants because because there's a difference and cannabis does like one over the other I'm sure uh, or a right mix I mean there's a ability for research here like we we can't believe uh, the problem is of course we can't see these guys um, and there's no instrument yet uh, that you can put in your pocket uh, that you can you can identify them the databases are there and in the next five or ten years I'm convinced we're going to be able to point our telephone. Uh, for, for camera at, at, at a uh, liquid sample uh, and be able to tell what's in it. Uh, it's coming. Uh, but in the meantime, we know some of the grossities um, and, and we ought to take advantage of this stuff. So, so that actually provides... So that actually provides me with an awesome opportunity to move kind of into the next kind of segue and bring, bring it back a little bit and, and have a little bit of fun with this because it... It probably didn't dawn on you writing your first book that you that you would be in a position right now. Like in our stage, you know, Wendy's an award winning grower. Che is an award winning grower. And these people like it's the foundation of how they built a lot of their processes and a lot of their work it was, or at least greatly influenced by it. Um, would you have thought that writing the first book that you'd have these these incredible farmers doing such incredible things? Things using the knowledge that you shared or was it just kind of you know like th there must be an, an interesting feeling yeah it was an interesting feeling for two reasons one is i always like to point out to people i mean i didn't invent this stuff dr elaine did you know i mean i'm i'm the reporter uh, uh and so so i certainly don't deserve any any credit for it um but but i i did know when i heard her speak the first time that what i was hearing was actual true science. And that everything that I had really sort of based my gardening grower experience on prior to that was less than scientific. Um, you know, I mean, I, my, my father knew J.I. Rodale. I, we had him over for dinner, you know, and we didn't spray our apple trees in the orchard and all that kind of stuff, but nobody ever talked about microbes. Uh, nobody, if you talked about bacteria or fungi, they were bad things. You had to get rid of them. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I regretted not bringing up to uh, Alaska uh, from my from when I moved there from New York was my father's soil sterilizer. <laughs> uh, you know, it's cr crazy, but I but but when I heard her speak and and translate then into a book, I knew that this was the future. What I what I didn't know was sort of how spot on her research was and that it, and how all encompassing, you know, and of course you sit back at, uh, today and you think, well, of course, all plants operate like all plants operate. They're a plant. Um, but back then there wasn't, you know, there was much more appreciation for the myth that your grandmother taught you than for the ability of a plant to be able to take care of itself. Uh, and so, so I, yeah, I, I had a little bit of an inkling. Uh, I had a real sadness that my father and my grandfather weren't alive to learn this stuff. Um, and, and, and it sort of reminded me of when I was first exposed to geometry. It just fits. It makes sense. You can't negate it. You know, it's not, it's not like a political argument or, 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 
you know, people are still negate trying to negate global warming. There's just no way you can negate this stuff. This is how the redwoods grow. This is how the dandelion in your lawn grows. It's just it, period. Uh, and 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 once I had that feeling, which was early on hearing Dr. Elaine speak, uh, it was just such a beautiful fit that I that I knew this would be the this would be what people would learn. But I hadn't I had no idea. Um, that that many people really, really wanted to learn. I mean, well, you, you, you go to the garden writers today, for example. Uh, I remember in 2006, uh, when, when we, or, two, or 1998, I, I asked the garden writers, 750 people, how many people know what a mycorrhizal fungi is? And nobody raised their hand, not one garden writer. Today, how many people use chemicals in their gardens not one garden writer would raise their hands. I mean, the the shift has been phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I I had to take a quick minute and have a have a dab there. It is at the half an hour point, so I'd like to do a little reset and let people know what's going on. We are here on the Dank Hour Future Cannabis Project with an amazing with our amazing panel of extreme guests. Sorry, my microphone was a little bit further away from me. Um, I just did, did, gave you a little you overload there just so I can uh, do the, you know, in-between portion here. Um, I just want to invite everybody to make sure to like and check out Jeff. I've, I've put his website at the top um, and, and you can get in there with his new book coming out. Make sure to be going out there and purchasing that new book. Uh, that is definitely very, very, very important. Um, we will get into where you can and all that stuff later on in the episode. Um, but for now, I think it's important to get that hit that little square on the bottom with the upwards triangle and give it a share wherever you can. Grab a replay and reshare it out somewhere. You have my permission to use whatever comes up out of this conversation in any way, shape, or form to create as much conversation as possible because that's what we're doing. We're trying to move things forward. Now, as we said, I did mention earlier, I was talking about these. Well, so I'd love to give give uh, Wendy an opportunity to jump in and and, and kind of chat, say hi, and and, and give it, throw together some of her two cents. Yeah, this is so exciting. I as soon as Jeff started talking and started mentioning the rise of phagy cycle, I was like jumping up and down because I was uh, introduced through a Zoom to Dr. James White last year on a podcast. It was um, the Green Bicycles podcast. And it was so cool because up until that time, I was a pretty hard like fungus person. I was like the opposite of Tess, like super excited by microbiology and everything, even though I'm not a microbiologist, but um, I call myself an armchair scientist. <laughs> um, but, uh, but on the opposite side of the microbiological train. So very much focused on bringing fungal diversity into my soil and very much focused on trying to push that balance uh, towards the fungus and away from the bacteria a little bit. And that conversation with Dr. White just shifted everything. I was like, oh man, I still have it all wrong. After all the things we've been reading and learning, like we still don't know anything out there. And um yeah, and it, we're, we're super excited in February in Massachusetts, Dr. White's actually going to be talking at um, the conference there. So there's an organic cultivator supernatural conference, and I'm so excited to shake that man's hand in person. Um, but yeah, it's the more that I cultivate and the more that I look at my soil under a microscope and, you know, I, I don't know half of what I'm seeing. Heck, I don't know a quarter of what I'm Heck, I don't know a tenth of what I'm seeing. You know, I probably don't know a hundredth of what I'm seeing under there. <laughs> but I can tell the difference between fungus and, and bacteria for the most part. And even then I'm still wrong sometimes, but point being that the more that I see my soil moving towards a better balance of fungal to bacterial ratio, the easier it gets for me to be cultivating with a less hands-on approach. And um, it is, it's exactly what Jeff was just saying. Like it's so hard sometimes to step back and let nature take control. But the more you can do that, I swear the easier it gets. And the more you get to tinker with other fun stuff, like instead of, you know, micromanaging your plants all the time, you can do some really fun experimentation. You can see, okay, I'm going to use some thermal compost over here and use vermicompost over here. And maybe I'll play with the ratio of them over here. Um, we used to be pretty much a strict thermal composting garden or farm, I should say. Um, 
So lots of mushroom compost, lots of, you know, we use some manures and stuff too, but uh, did not really use earthworm castings back then. Uh, they were really, really expensive. So you could only make so much on your, you know, your home. And I wasn't doing anything to kind of look for a more fungal balance until I started learning about Korean natural farming. And, um, you know, kind of started playing with that and realizing, okay, you can do stuff to increase your, your fungal load, if you will, on your soils. And how does that play out? What, you know, what happens? And I'm like, wow, we use so much less fertilizer than we ever did before. Yields haven't decreased, quality still up there, and, um, you know, more pest resistance, or apparently more pest resistance, I should say, and, uh, you know, apparently more resistance to mold and botrytis and powdery mildew and all the things that attack plants. So, yeah, the more you can, you know, encourage your soil life in whatever track you want to take, the more changes you see and the easier it gets. And for me, that's just, it, it geeks me out. It's so much fun. Geek's the right word, isn't it? It is, right? <laughs> yeah. And I love talking with other soil, you know, it's the grand tribe of soil nerds, because I don't know, there's uh, not that many people that, you know, want to go out and read four books on soil microbiology. But those of us who do, actually, and there's more and more now. It's kind of crazy. I think, Jeff, when I first bought your, your books, the trio was out. No, it might have just been the first two. I can't remember now. But uh you know, I read them and I was, or well, I bought them for a while and then I finally read them and uh, it was just super fun. It was, it was, you know, palatable for me at least and fun to get together with other people and start being like, oh my gosh, you guys, did you know all of this? And people were like, no. And then years later, like seeing those same books at my grow shop and I was like, what? This has become so mainstream that it's at my little tiny town's grow shop. Like, this is so cool. Yeah, Wendy, I was just thinking about that, how, Jeff, your books were in a uh, small town, Northern California, but the epicenter of cannabis cultivation and, and probably the, the world, um, there was copies of your books posted up there on the front, um, on the front desk where you're, where you're checking out. So that it's crazy to think that your books reached that big of an audience and, and yeah, you know. <laughs> It is crazy. It's absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's, they're translated in all manner of languages. I'll tell you though, I'll know I've made it when I'm watching one of these commentators on a TV station, and you know, you always look at the books they've got behind them. I want to see uh, some good cannabis books behind these guys. <laughs> I know they're all dopers, and uh, it'd be fun to see it. But you know, it's 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 people like you though who tell people, "Gee, this is this seems to work." Uh, you know, and, and you and you guys all sell the books. Um, it's really it's really heartening, and I and I certainly thank everybody for it. But again, I have to point out, this is Dr. Elaine Ingham. This is Dr. James White. All, all I do is report this stuff, uh, and and so I, I I I take your 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 accolades, but they really they really should be addressed to to. Uh, uh, Elaine and, and James, but uh, I'll pass it on uh, next time I see them. And and they are definitely addressed to them as well. I have a question, Jeff. I was wondering if you heard or have followed anything at all of uh, Dr. Christine Jones. I just recently got introduced to some of her YouTubes. She has a set of four YouTube videos that are um, addressing the soil food web, but also a little bit of a sidestep from what Dr. Elaine taught from my understanding. I haven't watched them all. It's been harvest season. I've been really busy, um, but just recently got introduced to those and went, wow, this is kind of another new way to look at stuff. I, I'll, I'm, I'm going to have to look at it. I, I, I'm pretty sure I met her with Judy Fitzpatrick uh, who invented the microbiometer. I don't know if you, you yes. are aware of that. Uh, and and uh, it's an instrument that you can, Look it up on the web, www.microbiometer.com. Um, she just died, unfortunately, but but the company is, oh. is thriving. Uh, you can measure the microbial mass. So you can measure whether teeming, whether you're teeming with microbes or whether you're putting something on that's not helping uh, or that's hurting the soil. Uh, you know, information is power. And one of the problems we have is getting that information. What do you... 
you know, what instruments, what readings, uh, you know, we can take pH uh, and we need to learn and be able to do more things with regard to microbes, um, you know, measure the fungal bacteria ratio, uh, identify them, um, see whether uh, uh, they're mycorrhizal fungi or just regular fungi. All of these things are coming and, and it's, it's just exciting as possibly can be that people are interested enough in it to study and, and invent things that they're going to make us all better growers. It's fun. These are fun episodes. I don't, I feel like I don't have to work, but I have so many questions. I don't, I didn't think to, so let's, let's get into the, the, the cannabis side. Cause of course it is the dank hour and I, and I expect we're all consuming a little bit. So like what it, like you, you have the do it yourself auto flower book. How did that come about? How did things come? And you're like, you're also like pretty ingrained with the cannabis community from my understanding, like you're close friends with Deb Rosenthal, like you, you know, the community yeah. well. So could you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, back in the day, there weren't many of us. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I think I first met most of these folks uh, either through the garden writers, Tom Alexander, Jorge. Uh, in fact, George, I remember sitting in a coffee shop with George and he said to me, uh, George Van Patten, for those who don't know Jorge Cervantes, he said, uh, you think I could make a living? You think I could make a living selling books on marijuana? <laughs> That's how far back we go. Um, you know, it's just one of those things. There weren't that many people who were willing to talk about it. Uh, and those that did seem to gravitate to each other. Uh, you know, nobody likes to smoke alone, so to speak. And, and uh, you know, so it became kind of a, kind of a little club, OG uh, folks. And, and it's always so much fun to get, get together and, you know, compare notes and laugh about the old days and some of the silly things we've done. I mean, we, none of us, you know, ever expected cannabis to be legalized and blah, 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 all kind of stuff. But um, it's really, it's, it's just spectacular. And, and, and all of us follow this stuff. I, 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 I worked with Ed on, on the soil portion of his la latest book. Um, you know, the soil food web is integral to, to, to what he does, to what Jorge does. Uh, you know, it's just uh, Tom Alexander introduced me to the soil food web. It's just uh, they, everybody in the industry seems to be on board moving forward. You know, the regenerative movement, uh, I, I, I call it the soil food web movement, uh, is, is just ever present, is everywhere. I, I got it. Like, <laughs> it's hilarious because it is, a, it's, it's, it's an. In it's such a major part of our aspect. And I, I think this is really funny because people, the people always, oh, what's OG, OG. And I'm like, you know what OG really means to me? Original gardener, you know, huh. like these, these were the OGs. And I, I love that story. That's really quite classic. It's funny because I use it as old, old guy now. <laughs> we're the old guys. Uh, but you're right at the time. I mean, you know, and it was, you know, they all they all went through Operation Green Merchant. If you don't know what that is, you need to look it up. Um, these were the pioneers. I mean, uh, who who do stuff, and some of them you've heard of an awful lot. Some of them you haven't heard of. You know, I always sing the praise of Tom Alexander, who wrote Sansamia Tips back in the day. Uh, he gets very little credit because he doesn't publish now. My goodness gracious, what these guys endured, uh, you know, in the, the years that they sp spent in the federal penitentiary and all that kind of stuff. Really, it's unbelievable. And today it's, it's, it's at the point where the president of the United States, uh, you know, is going to put it into a different category finally. Wow. Unbelievable. Uh, so it's so important that we grow it and that we grow it using microbes so that people aren't putting chemicals in their bodies and all that good stuff. So that, that kind of brings me to the next segment that I wanted to get into before we open up for questions, because we will open up and you can come up on stage and ask your questions for the last 30 minutes of the episode. So in about 15 minutes, we're going to open that up. But for now, I wanted to get into that and, and talk about your challenge. Like, like, I've completely lost my train of thought. Totally crap. This is strong. <laughs> uh, what were you, you give me the last tail end of what you just said there, Jeff. You got to grow properly. Uh, you know, using the microbes uh, so that you get the best cannabis you can. Uh, and I think probably what probably what you were going to ask was, 
you know, so what do we need to be doing? Is there anything different we have to do as a result of rise of fasci? You know, what, 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 what's different? So, you know, what do we, what's the takeaway from all of this stuff? I think. Uh, and I I'll think you, got, you nailed that, Jeff. You really yeah. nailed that. That was exactly, <laughs> that was so on brand with what I was doing. You have no, oh no, actually I did, I do have an awesome question. So we're going to hold off on your question just to bug people because they're going to have to wait for it. My question was, how does it feel to be one of the first people to run for a major political like position <laughs> that's also written a cannabis book? Yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, although I was running for Don Young's seat, uh, many people don't know this, but cannabis has been legal in Alaska in the privacy of your home since 1975. And Don Young was one of the founders of the cannabis, uh, Congressman Don Young, the Cannabis Caucus, they called it. Uh, so, you know, people didn't even, it never, ever came up, not once. That shows you the difference, I think, between today and, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, where if you were even, you, you even used the word cannabis, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't get a single vote. It, it, and it is, it is changed. It's, it's been a great deal of change. We need, there, but there still needs to be change. Like I was having a conversation earlier today. People think that like just the first step of legalization is, is like all of a sudden we're legal and okay, everything's fine and down. You got to keep your mouth shut and not say and speak up and, 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 and get things changed. But it's, it's the opposite. You, once you get legal, that's the seat at the table to bitch. You know, that's the seat at the table to be able to develop and change and, and really move your industry forward in an appropriate and measurable way. And that's how you get there, period. Right. And you, and it's not it's like, oh, we're legal. Let's be quiet and just make sure that we're, we're OK and we, we don't break any rules or, or, or cause any challenges or be, be not be a problem. It's it's the start of being the problem. You're legal now. So you got to make your own legal space. So I just I had to just throw my little thing out there. So we got to side spin it and go right into the rhizophage. You know, like how, and often, often it is with these books and these amazing pieces of knowledge that, that, that we get to listen to. They're great pieces of knowledge, but how do we actually practically apply them to our daily gardening life or what we're doing at home? Sure. Uh, I mean, you, you got to use all the stuff that's in the, you know, the rules of the soil food web still apply. Uh, there's just a couple of things that you need to do and emphasize. And, and most of them have to do with the seed itself. It turns out that the endophytic bacteria end up into the in the flower, and when a seed is formed, uh, they get trapped in the seed. And so there's a few uh, inside the seed, uh, and then there's a bunch of them uh, that are in the seed coat. And those bacteria are key because when you when you look at the soil uh, for let's just say uh, a Malawi cannabis plant and the soil from a Durban poison cannabis plant. When you look at the soil, generally the soil bacteria, microbes, they're generally the same, but no matter what the plant. But when you go inside the plant, you discover that the endophytic bacteria are different. This will blow your mind that those are the endophytic bacteria that give the plant its special taste and characteristic. So if you grow a Durban poison plant uh, that's from a seed 400 years ago and look at the endophytic bacteria in that plant uh, versus one grown today, the endophytic bacteria should be pretty much the same because they're carried in the seed. They jump off the seed into the soil, and they're then available to go into the plant and become endophytic again uh, when, when the new plant grows. So it's very, very important that you treat your seeds properly. That means you don't sterilize them. Of course, nobody ever really probably uh, fully could sterilize them. Labs do it, but, but I think you know most people, uh, sterilizing is a bad, bad idea. Uh, you don't store the seed in airtight containers because those bacteria need to breathe and they actually breed, breathe through the seed coat. So we've always been taught, you know, you, you put it into a little 
container and you keep it dry and airtight. No, 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 no. Uh, it needs a little bit of moisture and it needs air. Um, you think about planting and using clones and, and whether you're missing some of the stuff that would have come from um, the seed uh, so that maybe you don't, you, you know, you, you adjust how you do stuff. When you gather seeds, do you gather seeds that have fallen to the ground and go through the natural cycle? Or do you just take the seeds that happen to be in the plant that you're hanging up and drying so that you can use the, the stuff? It's all fascinating. And then the trichomes, because it turns out the bacteria also exist inside the trichomes and they produce nitrogen in that trichome. In order for them to produce the nitrogen, they need to get carbon, which they get from the plant, and they need to be in an oxygen uh, poor area. And that happens because the plant produces cannabinoids in the trichome to reduce the oxygen so that fixation of nitrogen can occur. So, you know, quickly, I just sort of rammed a bunch of stuff through there, but your your strain of cannabis tastes the way it does because of the microbes, the bacteria that are endophytic in it. Holy cromolo. That's the answer, you know, that Frenchie always wanted to, to war. That's why we never could get to war. You know, you, you, you plant uh, uh, two plants, uh, Durban poison and, a, and a, another land race in the same kind of soil. They still taste like Durban poison and another land race because they have those bacteria. Wow. Hopefully that answers a lot of people's questions. Uh, uh, don't. Tess? Got, that's, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I love it. I love the whole discussion of like terroir and how microbes contribute to these things. I mean, it's pretty well established in other plants and humans and other interactions between bacteria and fungi and other uh, organisms that, of course, there's these relationships and there are these exchanges going on. Do you think that there are, you know, I know that there's some limited like sequencing that's been done on like cannabis microbiome or the microbes that live and associate with the roots of cannabis. Um, I don't know of very many that were, have been done with trichomes or with, or to like really specifically look for like those bacteria and fungal organisms that are specific or BFFs with cannabis. Have you seen anything or would you hypothesize what you might find based on what we know about like hops and other things? Like how, how what, yeah. what do you think about that? Well, there are a number of, of studies that are beginning uh, to come out. Now, remember, we have a problem studying cannabis plants in the United States because of the damn True. thing you know, attitude, but, but there are studies that are coming out. Uh, one of them definitely demonstrates that the microbes in the plant, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the trichome are sprayed with different kinds of cannabinoids and have a awful lot to do with the taste and the effect of that, of that. Um, they're, they're, they're beginning to identify them as far as I know, but it's expensive and difficult work to do. I mean, the databases are there for what the microbes are. I mean, we, we've got bacterial databases. You've just got to get the RNA, the DNA, uh, in order to be able to uh, uh, identify what they are. And they're beginning to do that. So there are, and I mentioned them in the book, and unfortunately, I don't have it in front of me, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to do this as a teaser. There's four or five different uh, microbe formulations that are available uh, as azospirillium is one of them um, that people are beginning to use uh, when they grow cannabis to sort of try to emulate some of the stuff that's going on. And, and sure enough, there's going to be somebody come along and develop the right microbial mix so that you get maximum amount of fixation inside the micro, inside the uh, cannabis plant, um, both for taste and for fertilizer. Uh, it's it's got to be coming. There's no question about it. I love it. I think I totally agree with you. I think that that's, 
that's like on the agenda. And then there'll probably be like slight adaptations to, you know, incorporate your climate if you're going outdoors. And, you know, because not only do you want to select for and enrich for microbes that like cannabis and they have a good relationship for all sorts of different reasons, including cannabinoids and terpenes and but also they have to be able to tolerate the environment that the plants are growing in or maybe the unique soil composition and stuff like that. So I see like this whole spectra of like, kind of like when you see those maps where it's like, plant, start planting in May and it's like all color coded purple and it's like further south and then June is a little further north. I wonder if we'll see those kind of uh, regional and soil differences for the microbes that we end up like recommending for specific kinds of plants and even strains down the road. That's just like, I, London just had this little like uh, gift that was like a brain exploding and that's what's happening to me right now. <laughs> well, you know, when you think about it and, and you just stimulated something that in my mind, I mean, uh, I am very fond of autoflower uh, cannabis Incidentally, I don't use the word marijuana because it's a, to me, uh, it's just a hats off to Harry Anslinger, the asshole who, you know, who used marijuana because he thought it was a, a derogatory sounding word, blah, blah, blah. So I only use the word cannabis. Um, and autoflowering cannabis to me may actually autoflower because of the bacteria that are carried in the seed, blah, 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 blah. Holy crow. So I'm going to have to start what? thinking about that. You know, I mean, it's it, it, from because from my perspective, you know, autoflowering cannabis has now gotten to the point where uh, it's it's not only every bit as good as, from my perspective, uh, as as regular cannabis, um, but it but it indicated sativa cannabis, but it's it's it, you can grow more of it per acre. Uh, if you put it at two foot centers and you can uh, indica or sativa. So it's a, you know, it's gotten to the point where now it's as strong, if not stronger, blah, blah, blah. And of course, if you live in a place like Alaska, wow, it's the only way to go in the wintertime. Um, but to be able to, the, my point was to be able to use a plant that grows in 70 days to do some of this research to, you know, which works best does, does vermicompost versus compost. So, I'm certainly hopeful that people that are listening to this show experiment with this stuff uh, and and let us know, uh, you know, what 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 they're finding out because this is brand new stuff. So, I think and, it's and so it, fast. Oh, sorry, go ahead, London. Sorry, I gotta get this. So, what I'm how I'm interpreting, okay, is is that 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 you know cells that. that bacteria stripped of their cell walls internally you know taken up into a cannabis plant are greatly affecting the cannabinoid serpent and can even affect whether or not it's autoflower i mean we're talking like this feels like a little bit like a like a, a superpower Lewin, Lewin well, Hawk, you know what i mean like the yeah it does but i, I gotta just correct one there's a difference between i got i just got to correct one thing there's a difference between the rhizophagy endophytic bacteria because they're just there to feed the plant and go back out versus the ones that enter the plant and end up in the trichomes. Now they may and they may be they may be capable of doing rhizophagy, but they're not doing the rhizophagy cycle in the trichome like we thought they might be. We thought they literally might be growing the trichome, just like they grow the root hair, that they might be coming out and 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 coming down on the surface. Uh, you know, sort of like they go back out into the soil. But instead, what the research seems to show, and it's Dr. White's student that did this, it seems to show that the that the endophytic bacteria in the trichome don't cause the trichome to form, but they're in there and they're fixing nitrogen. And that nitrogen fixation requires the cannabinoids to take out the oxygen. So it's producing a cannabinoid because of the bacteria and the plant's need or desire for nitrogen. So maybe you bring up a really good point, Jeff. Like when you're talking about, you know, there's breeding for the organism, but then there's all these additional attributes that you gain as part of the super organism or like right. this 
microorganism plus all its associations with all these other microorganisms that are contributing to it. So it's not just your DNA. And this is true in humans, too. It's not mm -hmm. just your DNA that's contributing to the phenotype, the overall expression of what uh, is going on there. It's also you're relying on the DNA of other organisms to break down things for you to eat, to convert serotonin, to um, do all these different things that we know contributes to our sleep and our overall mood and our... Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, all these different things, but we're not relying on our own cells and our own DNA. We're relying on our the super organism, which is us plus our microbiomes to do this. And I think that it's really interesting that you bring up autoflowering because I think that's fascinating. If that's a trait that maybe there might be like a genetic predisposition, but maybe you could potentially make that a little bit more bendy by adding certain types of microbes. Right. Um, right, right, so right. that it really does blend the line between breeding and these ecosystem sort of thinking. Sure. Well, and, and it ought to also make you think about your, you know, your own body. I mean, the the bacteria in your intestine, <clears throat> back in through or, or in your stomach, back in through the intestine into your system, the same way they back into the plant during rhizophagy. It's butyric acid. That, that that signals them to do the traveling. It's just wow, you know. Uh, I mean, why would we be that much different from a plant? It's just, it's crazy. Um, so, so there's a lot of similarities between what's going on us us and them. I mean, it's just, and there's no question we are most more bacteria than human cells. I would I would say half, but uh, and and we are bacteria and plants are too. Yeah. Excellent. So, I mean, so is it kind of like, how do we, do we have a way of like, is there, is there a, is there a process of, of finding these bacteria within the trichome heads? Like, how do we know that they're there? Yeah. Well, Dr. Uh, Dr. White's uh, paper or with his students uh, sh shows where they are. Um, has a very, very nice diagram. Uh, and all you need to do, uh, well, it has a very, very nice diagram of, of, a tr of what a trichome would look like, uh, you know, what direction the bacteria move in. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all there. Um, and you can find it by Googling Dr. James White uh, bacteria trichomes. And it should just pop up. And then you can, you know, Google is, is our best friend. Uh, we can find all this great stuff. Awesome. And we are at the one hour mark. And before we tail it down, because we do need to save a little bit of time at the end to make sure to give Jeff an opportunity to tell us where to connect with him. But before we do that, we got some questions and comments. And I got, I got a good one to start it off. An ecological project asks, can we get Jeff's favorite endophytes? <laughs> My favorite endophyte. Gee, that's a tough question. My favorite endophyte. I don't have one. I'm going to have to get one. Uh, I don't have one. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite bacterium or, or, or something along those lines, like some sort of, of microbe? Well, you know, I mean, I, I like them all. My, I think my favorite are paramecium. I love paramecium. You know, and somebody asked, are you going to do a book called Teeming with Paramecium? Uh, I like the bacillus, the bacillus bacteria, which happen to be uh, available for purchase in a lot of grocery stores. Uh, the bacillus is kind of neat because it's capable of, in adverse conditions, of saying, uh-oh, trouble coming, and it forms, uh, a, you know, into a spore, and it can regenerate when trouble is gone. Uh, so the bacillus is kind of fun. And and azosporilium is one of those bacillus, I believe, which specifically you can look for at a grocery store. Very cool. So Michael Wolf Seagal asks, do bacteria have specific fluorescent levels? I'm thinking it should be possible to do fluorescence as a counting method. Wow, talk about, oh, geez. I mean, Michael, holy crow, how you doing, buddy? Uh, you know, the man who invented the uh, sea of green, 
um, uh, and spent time in the pen. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer because uh, I'm not as smart as you, Michael. Uh, but I think you may be right. Uh, why don't you do the experiment and find out? Let us know. I, I did bring him up here to come say hi. So you want to say hi there, Michael? Um, okay, there I go. Yeah, you know, hi, Jeff. Um, I think it's possible, and the reason why I don't do it is I'm still out here hunting for some someone who wants to turn my brainstorms into the rainbows that lead to their pots of gold and do some serious research because that time is coming where we're going to be able to do it. And there's a whole lot of stuff. Um, have, have you, are you still playing with the incentive light? Is it affecting, have you noticed it affecting um, what's there in the surface of, uh, of the soils? Yeah, you know, I, I because post COVID I, or pre COVID, I, I, I stopped at COVID and I have not, I've been following and, and chatting with these guys uh there are a couple of grow places that are using them they're they're fabulous uh i have not studied the soil uh in 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 these plants uh, nor have i for led for that matter either um i remember when we were looking at the light and and you had some conversations about i mean the 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 whole question of light and microbes they're so intricately involved and and tied together another area of research worth doing at some point in time, you know, we're going to get, as you as you alluded to, university-sanctioned microbial cannabis light fluorescent, uh, you know, candy bar the door research on our favorite plant. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that in terms of spectroscopy, we should be able to shine light into that pool. You were talking about wanting to be able to hold your phone over a pool and identify what's there and the, the 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 science of optics has come so far and and electroscopy micro and electro microscopy that i i would think that if you've got a, a, a something that's putting out particular frequencies you ought to be able to get it back i agree and, and, i agree and be able to identify it that way I agree. I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, at my age, uh, I'm not smart enough to be able to do it, but I agree, uh, you know, vibrations and fluorescence and, and uh, uh, the accessibility of some of these things is simply amazing. I, 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 I stay a lot of times in Portland and there's a place around the corner that literally a window shop uh, electron microscope store. You can buy an electron microscope. You can have samples tested. Uh, and I'm hoping that that he's also got conflower, uh, a confocal, which is what Dr. James White uses to see these bacteria. The pictures of the, of of root hairs before and after confocal uh, uh, microscopy, it's just night and day. No bacteria. Who knew they were there? Well, the reason is because they look like this, and then you take a look at the next slide and you go, "Whoa! Look at all the bacteria." It's just is a different that, is that the same. one where you do like slice after slice after slice and then uh yeah. read oh when, when wendy or no um suzanne wainwright the bug lady is, is doing that with her pictures of, of um yeah. insects yeah, and, and it's amazing it's it is phenomenal yeah phenomenal stuff. that's understating it <laughs> yep yep well always good to I speak definitely, to you michael yeah. Yeah, I definitely think so. Just to pop in here, there's like you guys said, there's so much that's done with fluorescence. Well, actually, a lot of like modern sequencing is done with fluorescence. You can look at each of those nucleotides or kind of the genetic uh, blueprint of a lot of these different microorganisms. So um, you can look at that A, T, C, and G. You might remember it from like biology class. Uh, and, and each of those, if you do sequencing in a very specific way, it'll release a different color. So you can then go through and kind of assemble that big novel that ends up being the DNA um, or just yeah. little bits and pieces that you know are unique. Because even like 
with microscopy and I love microscopy. It's so cool. And even like if you were to detect general bioluminescence, you might not know what those specific species are. Like Jeff was saying earlier, it's really tough to tell these species apart from each other. It's not like I used to tell my students, like, you know, when you're going out in your ornithology class, you can go and you can identify these things because you can see them. They have very distinct characteristics visually. Microbes, even when you see them under a microscope or at high resolution, you can't usually tell them apart from each other, especially closely related species or even strains within those species, which one strain might be a friend to the plant and the other strain might be a foe to the plant. So it's important to have those sequencing abilities, but those are getting more and more efficient all the time. So Jeff, down the road, who knows, maybe you could put, you know, connect it up to your uh, phone and just go through and do sequencing and know what's in your soil, or at least loosely know. I think that that's really fascinating. As for questions, I don't see a lot of other ones. Jeff, did you have a response? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, it's, it's it's getting to the point now where you can, I believe, send in a sample of soil, uh, you know, to a university lab, and they can tell you it, it's expensive, and it, it takes more time probably than you want in your garden or your grow, but they can tell you what your microbial mix is in your soil. Yes. I mean, they can yeah. they, yeah, so so it's it's there. If they can do it, the databases say, as I say, are there. It's 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 the phone, uh, and we're getting making it, right it approachable so we can do it at home. That's kind of that next transition. But now they've gotten like sequencing the human genome down to like a hundred bucks. So it'll only be a ma matter of time before they right. do it to plants. Hopefully, well, not just plants. Sorry, but also all of the organisms in like a gram of soil, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah, and it is amazing. I mean, you know, you, you've got guys like Michael and me, we can remember, you know, having a brownie camera with 12 pictures in it. And you had to wait, you know, over the course of a month and a half to figure out what 12 things you wanted to take a picture of. Look at today. I mean, and then we get the microbiometer and there's all sorts of instrumentation coming off the, off the, off the phone. It's there. We're going to get there. And we're going to get to the point where the big companies, you know, the, the, the evil chemical companies are going to abandon chemicals for biologics. Uh, and we're going to we're going to be growing our food uh, in a much more sustainable way using biologics as opposed to uh, chemical ferts and chemical pesticides. Uh, there's no question about it. Because, because it makes so much sense from a sustainability, from a regenerative perspective, to take us back to the beginning. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, we, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Uh, we've got global warming and, and, and it's the chemicals that's, that, that's causing it. And we got to stop. So that being said, we're we're at the tail end here. And before we ask you the, the, the last question, which is where and what and why and how and how we can support you, I wanted to, to take an opportunity and ask you, like, because we talked a little bit about technology and it, it developing forward. Is there a good piece of technology, a piece of equipment that someone can buy that can be serious, that can help them, you know, get, get ahead of the game or, or not even ahead of the game, just help them understand a little bit more than maybe they did yesterday. Um, is, is there something that you would advise for people to, to bring into their home? Maybe something that's not overly expensive that your more average person could have. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you can get a microscope, but who can get a microscope for a hundred bucks or so? Um, I really like the microbiometer. Um, I advise the company, I should tell people. Um, but but, you know, to, to know whether what you're doing to your soil is increasing its quality or decreasing its quality or doing nothing at all and you're wasting your money is very important. Uh, and if you're a cannabis grower, you know, you want to only use organic stuff. You want to be able to test whether that organic stuff you're using is working. Uh, and, and the microbiometer is the way to go. Yeah. So I did. And, I, I, I hate to do this, but Susan Wainwright seemed to have jumped into the audience. So we're going to give her an invite up. Yeah, she wants to come say hi. And I did shoot you an invite, Susan. If, if you want to come say hi, 
and we are coming to the tail end. There we go. It looks like she's now a speaker. Welcome to the state. You will have to unmute to uh, speak if you if you. Can you hear me? Is it not working? Do you, you, we can't hear you, Susan. Oh, too bad. Do us a favor. It, sometimes this happens, especially if you haven't signed in for a little while. If you leave the room and come back in, it'll fix it. Um, oh, that's what my wife tells me. <laughs> <laughs> my wife doesn't tell me to come back in the room. She's just leave. <laughs> just go away. So while, while that's happening, do try and see if you pop in, close the app and come out back out and see if it comes up. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely jump to you. Um, but Johnny, um, you didn't have an option to speak that much yet. Did you have an option to have a question or something that you'd like to bring? You know, honestly, I'm just sitting back and enjoying the, the banter. Um, and really, you know, Jeff, you made a point to mention that, you know, Dr. James and, and Dr. Elaine, they're really, um, kind of leading the way, but I'm just going to say it, man, you, you make this stuff digestible um it, for for everybody and anybody to be able to pick this stuff up and you you pre-digest a lot of this information and really make it uh you kind of mama bird it um for the the average individual so you know you gotta you gotta put yourself up there because you are providing an amazing service to the community and world at large and and i'm just gonna sit back and and keep keep listening well, I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, but 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 again, I got I got to point out to people, I, I am reporting what these people, uh, James White and Elaine Ingham, have done. Uh, now that you you have a basis for it, you need to you need to follow their work and the work of those people that they have trained. Uh, and it's really easy to do using Google, uh, and you'll be amazed. You'll be simply amazed. Uh, doc, Dr. Elaine has so much information uh, that sometimes knowing it first, knowing it in a, you know, in a bare bones way, teaming with microbes, that's what it was for. Uh, but by no means should you stop at the books, continue on, there's research all the time and, and uh, new stuff and refinements is, well, rhizophagy is a perfect example. Yeah, yes, excellent. Did you want to try again? Are you able to open that mic up? Say hello. Is it working now? Oh, yes. oh yeah, it is. Okay, now I see things flashing around my name. I did what you said. I left and came back. and That's it. Fixed it. Awesome. Well, welcome. This is coming to the tail end of our episode. We did mention you a couple times. Do you want to let people know who you are and what you do? And welcome to the stage. My name is Les. Oh, hi. Yeah, my name is um, Suzanne Wainwright. I'm an independent insect consultant, and I've worked in the green industry my entire career now, just over 30 years. Um, but for the last just over 20, I've worked as an independent consultant working. Um, I actually come from more of the agricultural side of things, um, working with conventional um, greenhouse and nursery production, but I'm a specialist in biological control. And um, I did go to school for this. I have degrees in entomology and environmental horticulture. And I spend a lot of my time educating people and also uh, working with the different universities, um, helping kind of um, guide research on what we need research on. I'm sitting on a couple advisory committees now with universities um, for biological control. And um, and actually, I'm late because I kind of didn't know about this, but I was also packing because I'm flying out again in the morning for North Carolina. Awesome. Well, welcome. It's great to have your introduction. I will have to bug you at some point and connect with you to to try and have you on a show all of your own because um, we would love to have you as a guest here on the Dank Hour. It would be awesome. But we are in our last ten minutes. Did you? How do you know Jeff? Do you guys know each other well? Or did you just run into each other at a at a at a at a, at a farm? We've met. We've met at uh, talks. Yes, I would say we've met, but I do, we don't know each other. I would say well, we are right. acquaintances is probably the best term. 
I, I like to say, you know, anybody who's crazy enough to give a public talk on, <laughs> on insects or on microbes, uh, you know, we're going to get along well. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Well, thank you for coming up on stage. And that's kind of the fun thing about Clubhouse and this type of stuff is we're able to have these moments where we're able to interact in these fun and unique ways. Now, Jeff, we got the tail end because we're in our last 10 minutes here. First of all, new book it's out tell us a little bit about that and then yeah. we're going to need to find out about where and how we can support you but if you give us a little rundown on sure um my book is teeming with bacteria uh the organic gardener's guide to endophytic bacteria and the rhizophagy cycle Whew, quite a mouthful um you can get it anywhere books are sold uh, amazon obviously is the logical place um, it is in Kindle as well as hard copy, and I'm told it's also in Audible. Uh, I find that hard to believe given the number of bacterial names <laughs> that are in the book, and I just today wrote the publisher and asked for a copy uh, so that I could convince myself that somebody was uh, learned enough to be able to go through the book and read all those uh, names. Um, I have uh, a lousy website. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can reach me at uh, jeff at gardener.com. Takes me a little while, but I will answer your emails. I might not know the answer to the question. Um, my auto flowering book is uh, not part of my series, uh, it's called uh, DIY Auto Flowering Cannabis. I only advise it uh, for people, a purchase for people who are new to the subject. If you're a, a cannabis grower already, you know this stuff. This is for your Uncle Bob and Aunt Sally. Um, let's see, what else do you need to know? Uh, bad websites, again, as I, as I say. Um, I write a garden column that's in the Anchorage Daily News every Thursday www.adn.com and as you can tell you can hardly shut me up <laughs> we like that that's what we're here for we're here to just sit talking and get into it you know there's one other person on this stage that hasn't spoken before i ask the very final question uh, actually you actually answered it already i'm going to give che an opportunity to say hi and see see if, if there's anything that you questions comments anything for us this evening hey thanks london no i'm uh, i'm just all ears on this one i'm excited to have the opportunity to learn this passion of mine is understanding this microbial world and every time i listen to jeff i always walk away with uh, another pearl so i'm just uh, big ears at this moment thank you and there's dr anibus speaking in the very end i see you you want to say hi real quick? I'm so sorry. My parents are here and I haven't seen them in three and a half years. And I just thought I'd pop in at the very last second and just say hi. I'm so <laughs> sorry I missed it. I'll be listening uh, to the recorded version. So, so, so you know, Jeff, Doctor Anibis is 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 a dear has, has has been here with us since the very start. She's actually has her PhD in cannabis population genetics. Um, she is wow. one of the coolest human beings that I know on the planet. Um, so we love to. She, she's she's usually always here, but she has some family visiting from Australia a little bit long distance, so she wasn't able to make it today. Um, but uh, but yes, it's always great to have you here, Doctor. Thank you so much. I'm so sad that I missed it. This looks like it was an awesome show. There's so many people here listening. Oh my goodness! Hey, we'll have to get together. So in, uh, we have we will have to get together in Australia. I mean, I'm down. <laughs> you might you might be getting together sooner than that. Just as a heads oh up. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh, good! 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 Right. Just as a heads up, if things are going well, we are we are we were working with a, a new can we go check, definitely everybody check out Grower Source um, as, as we'll be working with them. There are some big announcements coming up with some of the cool stuff happening here in Vancouver. We're just finally uh, finalizing a couple things on exactly the how, what's, when, where's, why's, and and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, there, there could be something very, very, very cool coming up. But anyways, Jeff, thank you again. Do you have any closing statements for us before I close out the? 
well. Uh, everybody should harvest uh, some of their food and give it to the hungry, plant a row for the hungry. And uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that we are at peace and uh, loving each other for a long, long time. Awesome. Well, thanks again. This was an amazing episode, and I look forward to having each and every one of you back next week. Um, we have another great episode. I don't remember what it exactly it is off the top of my hat, uh, head. We, we did have an awesome episode earlier today on Cannabis for Breakfast, where we did a live show down at the uh, Vapor Lounge in downtown Vancouver and got to consume and taste a lot of very fun stuff. But thanks again, everyone. Thank you, all of our experts. And we look forward to having you again back here every Tuesday at 5 p.m. PST here on the Dank Hour. Thank you again. <laughs>